Good afternoon. Whoa, that's loud. Welcome to CSIS. Uh, I'm Sharon Squassoni, and I direct the Proliferation and Prevention Program. And it's my uh, pleasure to co-host this panel today with CSIS's Korea Chair, Victor Cha, who also happens to be a panelist today, and the National Committee on North Korea. Um, I'd like to introduce first Karen Lee, who is the Executive Director of the National Committee on North Korea. She'd like to say a few words about her program, and then I'll introduce the other speakers. Karen? Hello, everybody. I just wanted to have an opportunity to uh, thank CSIS, um, Sharon and Victor, for co-hosting this event, because uh, that's why all you wonderful people are in this room. We're very, very grateful to Patrick Morgan for coming all the way from California to join us today. Uh, I w had a particular interest in doing this program because I feel that in, um, in Washington, we get very swayed by the events of the moment. For example, what just happened on the president's, President Carter's visit. But I actually think that what we're talking about today is, is a fundamental issue in North Korea's nuclear weapons program. And I'm really glad to have such renowned experts to talk about what to me is one of the nitty gritty topics that eventually, I hope, will be discussed between the DPRK and other nations. Just a short word on the National Committee on North Korea. We are an organization that tries to improve the quality of information that is available about the DPRK, often by working with people with considerable hands-on experience inside the DPRK or working with North Koreans. With that, I'll turn it back over to Sharon uh, with my thanks. Thank you. We are delighted today to have Patrick Morgan, who will speak first um, for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have our other three panelists uh, respond to some of his remarks. Dr. Morgan is the tyranny chair of the Peace and Conflict Program at uh, the University of California at Irvine. Um, he's the author of many things, uh, including um, International Security Problems and Solutions. And also, he contributed to this publication, um, which came out last October, U.S. Strategy Towards North Korea, uh, where we um, helped co-author, or at least feed some information <laughs> to Joel Witt. Bobby, were you also part of that process, I think? Yeah, no? <laughs> uh, following Pat, we will have um, Victor Cha, who is our Korea Chair at CSIS. Um, he is also the Director of Asian Studies at Georgetown University. In the Bush administration, he was Director for Asian Affairs at the White House, as well as uh, the U.S. Uh, Deputy Head of the Delegation to the Six Party Talks, and I'm sure you're all familiar with Victor's work. Following Victor, we will have Bob Carlin, uh, who is the co-chair of the National Committee on North Korea and is now a visiting fellow at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford. Uh, he, I know Bob from uh, State Department days, but he was also a senior policy advisor at Quito um, and an intelligence and uh, research bureau at State, also known as INR. And uh, last but not least, we will have Jofi Joseph, um, who is currently the senior advisor to the Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security at the State Department, Ellen Tauscher. Um, and Jofi uh, has uh, published widely, and uh, I guess we first came in contact with each other on the Hill. Uh, most recently, he was the senior foreign policy advisor for Senator Bob Casey, but he also worked as a professional staff member on the Foreign Relations Committee. So we're delighted to have all of you and delighted to have this audience, and I will um, hand over to the floor to Dr. Morgan. One administrative note, please turn off your Blackberries and cell phones. And this session is on the record. Thank you. Pat, as you wish. What would you like? Yeah. So. Thanks very much. Um, I should uh, begin by saying 
I'm going to talk as a deterrent specialist. I would never claim to be a North Korea specialist. I spent a lot of time looking at Korean problems, issues, and I know lots of people who are Korean specialists because um, I'm associated with something called the Council on U.S.-Korean Security Studies, which is headquartered here in Washington. But I'm no expert, say, on North Korea. So, um, But I would uh, also add that I contributed, as she mentioned, to a study that Joel Witt put together, uh, uh, publication, mostly by answering his questions. He would send me a question and I would answer, and uh, so and I found, saw some, some of that showing up in print, you know, I thought, wow. And so what I'm going to talk about doesn't exactly fit with that, and so the panelists get to have to wrestle with some other things I'll say. But um, for a crowd like this, I think I don't need to spend any time on how the United States got involved in extended deterrence vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea, um, or more generally, just to mention very quickly that it was a new thing for the United States uh, after World War II, and it's really initiated essentially by NATO um, not long after that by the Korean War. So, um, And the United States gets into extended deterrence by then building a, a huge collection of allies and, I should emphasize, associates. People who are not formally allies, governments that are considered worth protecting, um, but also because in case of extended nuclear deterrence, the Korean War was the key event in stimulating an enormous American emphasis in relying on nuclear weapons to a considerable extent to deter the Soviet bloc that included the Soviet bloc in the Far East as well as in Europe. And that led very directly to having nuclear weapons stationed in Europe and stationed in Iraq, and the use of nuclear threats. So the United States introduced, because of the Korean War, an emphasis on nuclear weapons. Um, I mentioned, want to mention two other things which are important for what I'll talk about later on. The first is that the United States built a whole network of alliances, um, and they're often thought of in rather traditional terms, and lots of their literature on alliances reflects very standard alliance theory. Uh, and I've never liked that, and uh, the older I get, the more uncomfortable I am with that. And so I want to talk about how the United States is really interested in alliances as communities, very different from the classic sort of very pragmatic, practical kind of, you have an alliance because you've got some common interest for a while. Now, that's not the way the United States wanted to build alliances, and it was reflected in the fact that the North Atlantic Alliance was referred to relatively quickly as a community. So, and I'll talk about what that means. The other thing is that the United States has also never been used, interested in using alliances on the whole to do sort of classic balancing in international politics. The United States has thought in terms of constructing either globally or in various regions, dominant, even hegemonic coalitions. That's how it likes to do international politics security management, and that's how it's done it. And extended deterrence is very much a part of that. So that's the context within which I tend to put in my thinking about extended deterrence. Now let me just turn quickly then to some of the things that I talked about in this, cited in this thing. What are the functions of American extended deterrence and extended nuclear deterrence in East Asia? And I would list the following very quickly. Um, first, of course, protection for allies. You want to deter attacks on allies. That's straightforward enough. Uh, secondly, Reassure them that you use extended deterrence, the elements associated with extended deterrence, like having nuclear weapons in, in Korea for a long time, to reassure the allies about that and about their security situation. Uh, thirdly, um, that in turn becomes part of um, um, the structure of the region for security management, which the United States establishes. Uh, that's what extended deterrence is ultimately about. It's sustaining, helping to sustain all of that. Fourth, constraining the allies. The United States has used extended deterrence to try to limit the proliferation efforts of its allies, to try to limit the um, uh, conventional weapons uses by its allies. In other words, it's the, trying to avoid the classic problem of being uh, trapped by your allies in uh, some kind of conflict that uh, you don't want to have. You want to get involved in some kind of war. So that's a 
standard function. Next, of course, extended deterrence lays the groundwork in many ways for American power projection, power projection into uh, Northeast Asia, uh, into East Asia, and so on. Uh, and that's been central, of course, to the whole post-World War II American national security approach. Next, um, and something which is important to stress, um, extended deterrence, the United States argues, and I think correctly for the most part, has by helping to create this security management arrangement for the different regions, say in Europe or in Northeast Asia or in East Asia, has also allowed adjustments of substantial nature in the relative capacities of the states and societies to occur without sharply destabilizing consequences. So that's usually referred to as, as long as the United States has set up the a management of East Asian security the way it has, Japan can go from being a very desperate country in terms of still recovering from World War II into being the world's second largest economic system without fundamentally disrupting everybody's sense of security in the area. The same thing then turns out to be true with um, China. China has been benefiting from this. The United States makes this argument. China has substantially altered its capabilities. Is everybody really nervous? Not really in a classic international politics sense because you have this management system, this management arrangement, which is underpinned by extended deterrence. So um, next, not only do you want to reassure friends, allies, and so on, you also want to limit hedging against uncertainty. You want to hold down uncertainties about security so that you don't get hedging behavior, because hedging behavior can lead to sudden improvements in military capabilities, can lead to poking around into, maybe we ought to have nuclear weapons after all, et cetera. And that can be very destabilizing. So uh, if you can curb hedging, you can help allies to hold down their defense budgets. You can help them to hold down the political conflicts associated with that. Um, you can lay a better basis for your alliances building community. Um, so, I would say those are the, the kinds of things that extended deterrence is used to do. It's not usually described that way. And I would in turn place that, as I say, within this context that I mentioned earlier. That's how does the United States see alliances, number one, and number two, how does it do security management globally and regionally? So, now, let's talk about North Korea. And again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this part because um, it should be fairly straightforward. Um, North Korea has a terrible deterrence problem. It is a state with some very serious problems that leave it potentially very vulnerable and it has worked very hard to try to find some way to have enough deterrence to not have those problems overwhelm it. Um, and it's very much a product of the Korean War and the aftermath, and then very much a product of North Korea's finding after a while that it was attached to an economic system that did not produce as well, finding it was losing legitimacy in terms of comparisons with the South, finding it was not being able to keep up with uh, the Joneses in terms of military capabilities, finding that its allies were no longer reliable, et cetera. It's had a, a sort of a catastrophic alteration in its security situation. And what the United States has wanted to do um, is to apply coercion against the North for a whole set of reasons. And um, one of them, of course, is um, because it wants to deter any kind of North Korean direct attack, but given what I've just said about the North, that's increasingly rather improbable that you would have any kind of major effort by the North Koreans to attack. So that's not something that you have to list as a great success for deterrence in recent years. Maybe earlier, it was very helpful to have 
American deterrence operating on the peninsula, including even extended nuclear deterrence. I'd say now it's a success, but uh, you know, kind of so-so. We wanted to limit North Korea's deterrence capability. We do not like the idea that North Korea would have a capability to deter the United States from doing certain kinds of things against the North. And we also don't want that kind of capability to be available for some kind of blackmail activity by the North. We failed with that. We want to sustain, through our efforts to contain North Korea, our credibility for dealing with other countries of a similar sort. Uh, we don't have much of a gain to show there either. Um, we've tried to halt and reverse the North Korean nuclear weapons program. Failure. We have tried to prevent further proliferation in the region. Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, eh, success. And notice, I run down a long list of things we've been trying to do and we haven't had much success to list. Uh, what's left? Um, sustain regional security management, in this case, regional security, ma security management in Northeast Asia. Yeah. Everybody's very uncomfortable with that. Solving the North Korean problem is considered in many ways the key to getting a decent, sustaining North security management arrangement. The one we've got has not been able to deal with that problem that leaves the Chinese uncomfortable with it, leaves the Japanese somewhat uncomfortable. It certainly leaves, left the last uh, Korean administration uncomfortable with it, and so on. Um, we've also tried to halt other kinds of unacceptable North Korean behavior selling missiles, selling certain kinds of technology related to nuclear weapons, et cetera, failure. Um, the last one we might want to use extended deterrence for is something that gets talked about a lot, which is what happens if, what happens if North Korea collapses? What do you do if the Chinese want to intervene? Can we deter that? Uh, that's totally unclear, and it's not at all clear that you could do it. It's not at all clear that extended deterrence would, would help there, especially if the intervention was relatively limited. So that doesn't list very many successes. It's, how come? Why hasn't extended deterrence worked well? First, that's a long list of things to be trying to do. That's really overload on uh, extended deterrence. Secondly, of course, we're out of sync with China on a solution, and that's relevant to the point I want to make in just about two minutes. So I'll come back to that. That has not helped. Thirdly, it's hard to have mount a credible threat that could lead to war when you're involved in two other wars. So that's a problem. Fourth, if you wanted to put together a coalition to apply a substantial amount of force against North Korea, who would you go to? I mean, the South Koreans really don't want that kind of thing. The Japanese don't want to see that kind of thing. The Russians don't want to. You know, that's not a good thing. Uh, next, I see virtually no credibility in a nuclear threat. I don't, I don't think North Korea does really either. So I don't think we have much credibility with regard to that aspect of deterrence, extended nuclear deterrence. Um, I think in general, this is because, first of all, if you are the, been the leader in promoting nuclear nonproliferation, you do not want to have a use of nuclear weapons by anybody, including us. And so the question is, well, what if somebody else like North Korea used one? And I think the answer would be, if we can possibly make that the last use, we should, rather than imitate it. So I think it would be very difficult for policymakers to decide, oh, well, we're going to use nuclear weapons. And much of the world, I think, expects that. And if you then look at Obama and the Nuclear Posture Review, you find emphasis on, well, we, have one. we won't absolutely, Tristar, we won't absolutely say we won't use nuclear weapons, but we clearly want to continue to reduce the salience and potential use of nuclear weapons. We want to continue shrinking it. Right? And you're sort of saying things, well, maybe under extraordinary circumstances, we might, that kind of thing. Um, and finally, there's the problem. It's actually a burden in some ways. If you have such an advantage in conventional forces terms, 
it's very hard to legitimize using something else. And that's unavoidable in our case. Um, a last thing, I mentioned China before, I want to say it very quickly. If you're a deterrence analyst and you're looking at the problem of how to deal with North Korea and you want to apply pressure on North Korea, and you look at that situation carefully, you look at the history, you say, you know, the real problem is the real target of the deterrence has to be China, not North Korea. And we're not targeting China. Okay? And for a number of fairly obvious reasons, not least of which is, if you are responsible for trying to manage security in East Asia, and especially in Northeast Asia, that would hardly be a way to make the security situation look more pleasant, more relaxed, better handled, et cetera. And all kinds of difficulties in doing that. But in fact, doing it the way we're doing it now is putting more and more pressure on North Korea, like you're trying to put a lot of pressure on the Taliban in Afghanistan. And they've got a fallback place. They've got an alternative supplier. They've got, that's what North Korea is. The Chinese supply aid, they supply investments, they facilitate the North sales of various kinds of products which the U.S. doesn't want sold, etc. So, in effect, we have tried hard to budge North Korea and we've had no success. China has tried hard to budge North Korea with an alternative approach and I would say they can't show much success. The problem is, if we don't get a success because of their efforts, we get some severe costs in terms of our values, in terms of what we want. If they don't get a success in terms of our efforts, we're, we're not doing what they say has to be done, they're not paying a huge price. We're the ones paying the price. No. Um, so then, what does this tell us about the use of extended deterrence. I would say, first of all, the extended nuclear deterrence is essentially irrelevant now. It doesn't mean I want to say cancel it immediately, get out of the business, etc. Extended nuclear deterrence, as I'll explain in a minute, you can't quite, I think, do that. with. But it's of no real use in terms of trying to curb North Korea's activities in the ways that we would like to see. Um, so it's not useful in sort of realistic terms. Where it's still important is in symbolic terms. And, so, and I don't know how we get around that comfortably unless we do it slowly and carefully. And so what I recommend really is that we think about detaching extended nuclear deterrence from the North Korean problem, but gradually, and working with allies and so on on that. Uh, in the context, first of all, of trying to find adjustments in the regional security management arrangements that compensate for that in symbolic terms. Don't have the allies feeling, ah, this is the first step toward. I've already seen that kind of thing in reactions in some of the writings in Korea and in Japan about the nuclear posture review. Okay. Um, in addition, we'd have to wait, see if we can get any adjustments in the positions of the Russians and Chinese. Um, if we're going to use deterrence because we don't get any adjustments, it's going to have to be on a conventional level in terms of what we would be planning on using as military force. And we would also have to be thinking about Essentially this, we want to say it this way, in order to get change in North Korea's behavior, we need the Chinese help. And the way to get the Chinese help is to threaten to do things which will damage Chinese interests in Northeast Asia very substantially. That that's the only way to do it in deterrence terms. And I never like to analyze something like that by saying, oh, well, let's figure, in a classic way, saying, well, let's figure out what are the costs and benefits the other side will perceive and what are, I want to put the deterrence in the context that I described earlier. What's the kind of regional security arrangement? How would that, how does extended deterrence, nuclear or non-nuclear, fit into that? 
And how would that all be affected by doing something like this? Because you can imagine what you could do. I mean, supposing you said, fine, you're going to continue supporting North Korea. We're going to cut every other kind of support we can. No food, no money, no oil or gasoline, nothing. You bear the expense of your policies. Oh, that would be a scary thing to tell the Chinese. That's, you know, that's not good in many ways. Okay? Would that be good for Northeast Asian security? Ugh, I kind of doubt it. Supposing you said instead, you think it's all right for North Korea to have nuclear weapons. You won't do anything to prevent it. You're going to tell them not to have them, but you won't. Why should we then not turn to the soul and say, look, you've got to be on the peninsula with a nuclear North Korea. You're, if you want to have nuclear weapons, be fine with us. Turn to Japan and say, well, if you want to, maybe you got a next door name with Would the Chinese like that? I kind of doubt it. That would be a scary kind of thing to say. Would that be good for regional security and our general interest? In, no, it wouldn't. Be. See what I mean? It's, that's the way you have to work your way through this, is if you don't have a way to reach China in terms of some of China's important interests, then you have to think very seriously about using some other approach. I don't think you can just simply go at North Korea in the current situation and get anywhere. So I endorse working our way out of extended nuclear deterrence and applying it anyway in Northeast Asia uh, and using whatever we can in that regard to help influence North Korea's decision making and rethinking how we would use deterrence but because we want to use deterrence compellency in a broader context and we have to constantly keep that in mind. Stop there. Thank you. We have a lot to talk about. <laughs> Victor, do you want to talk from there? Or? Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Sharon. Um, and it's a pleasure to be co-hosting this event with the National Committee and Nonproliferation Program um, here at CSIS. I kind of feel like since I'm co-hosting, I shouldn't speak very long because if you're the host of a dinner party, you don't want to take the whole time giving the toast. Um, so I'll keep my comments pretty limited because I'd love to hear from both Bob and Jofi, uh, their comments. Um, and I'll make, let's see, three sets. The first is on the whole question of um, reassurance and extended deterrence that Pat talked about. Um, the second is with regard to this question of um, whether deterrence has failed um, with regard to North Korea. Um, and then the third is with regard to this question of um, what is the utility of extended nuclear deterrence anymore um, in East Asia and in the region. First on reassurance uh, and extended deterrence, um, clearly, you know, reassurance is a big part of extended deterrence. Um, and I, I would agree with Pat that the U.S. Um, vision and concept of the post-war alliances that it created in Europe and in Asia were about evolving to communities, not simply being just military alliances. And extended deterrence is a critical part of those communities. Even if these alliances evolve into being more than simply military alliances, if you don't have that core with regard to extended deterrence, it makes it very difficult to, to evolve the relationship. So how do you do reassurance? I mean, what we have seen is that the United States has done um, reassurance in terms of the credibility of extended deterrence through many policy statements. Um, uh, for example, after the uh, North Koreans did the first nuclear test in October 2006, and then the second nuclear test um, in May of 2009, um, it was um, I, I was part of the administration during the first test, not part of the second. After the first test, um, the immediate plan of action was clear, which was um, to go out to the region, to the allies, uh, to Japan and South Korea, also to go to China and Russia, but the first two stops were Japan and South Korea. And the first thing that our, our principal would do, at this time it was Secretary Rice, the first thing that she would do uh, is make very clear statements publicly about the continued credibility of U.S. Um, extended nuclear deterrence. After the second nuclear test in May of 2009, 
I was not in the government then, but I joked, well, it wasn't really a joke. I mentioned to my uh, wife that I know exactly what the administration is going to do. They're going to send, you know, a high-level official, in this case it was um, Deputy Secretary Steinberg out, to the region to make very strong policy statements about the continued uh, credibility of extended deterrence in spite of uh, these nuclear tests. So that's a very important part of assurance is are these high-level policy statements. Another important part of reassurance that we've seen developing more recently has been the focus on um, creating these very quiet uh, but high-level um, dialogues, um, conversations between the United States and allies, Japan and South Korea, about extended deterrence, about, trying how, about how to enhance extended deterrence. Um, we did some of these during the Bush administration, and I would imagine they're also doing these in the current administration. Um, and I always saw those exercises as, I mean, it, I, that the process of having that dialogue was as important as any tangible policy action that came out of the dialogue. It was, you know, a, a big part of credibility is, is uh, constant statements of reassurance, uh, conveying intentions, um, and that that process was important. So I think we've seen in both cases, the creation of these dialogues with regard to extended deterrence, both at the track one and track two level. Um, and I think these have been somewhat successful because we have also seen other developments, um, including uh, the, potent, you know, the zero option and statements that were even made before the Obama agenda on um, nuclear weapons uh, in which the United States has made some pretty forward-leaning statements about no first use with regard to North Korea, and they have not had a major impact <coughs> on credibility of, perceived credibility of deterrence either uh, in Japan or South Korea. In September of 2005, the six-party joint statement, as many of you know, had a clause in it which stated that the United States um, the United States will not attack North Korea with nuclear or conventional weapons. Uh, at the time, it was considered a very important statement. When the Russian delegation saw that we accepted this language for the sta statement, they were shocked because they said uh, that, you know, they had tried to get this from the United States throughout the Cold War but could never get it. Mm -hmm. um, but again, my point here is that having these policy statements and these conversations, these dialogues, mm -hmm. appears to have helped to at least uh, maintain a semblance of credibility with regard to U.S. extended deterrence in spite of some of these no first use statements. But I would add, the caveat is, uh, you can do all these things, but allies will never feel comfortable. Right? They will never feel comfortable with uh, statements of extended nuclear deterrence. Um, and one of the main reasons that's the case is because um, um, of something that in cognition, th I mean, not to get too um, um, academic, but in cognition theory is known as attribution error, mm. right? Which is essentially this notion that um, when you are trying to reassure an, an ally, the ally constantly fears it's going to be abandoned by you. So anytime you take an action of reassurance, so Rice goes to Japan and South Korea after the nuclear test to say, we are firmly committed to the defense country extended nuclear deterrence, the way allies perceive that is they perceive it as a positive statement, but they perceive it as being situationally motivated. In other words, it's a positive statement, it registers as a positive statement, but it's only because of the situation. They were forced to do this. The North Koreans just blew off a nuclear test. I mean, they were forced to do this. Uh, on the other hand, any time the United States makes statements that might sound like it's less reassuring, that might be inching away from um, uh, the credibility of extended nuclear deterrence, for allies that immediately registers as a dispositional attribute. In other words, the United States, you know, says they will not attack North Korea with nuclear or conventional weapons. That's not situational. That truly reflects American disposition, right? So, and this is a constant battle in the reassurance game. Uh, you are constantly seeing allies never feeling fully comfortable because what they deem to be positive statements are motivated by the situation, and those that are negative statements are seen as, ah, oh, that's their real character, that's what they're really thinking, that's their real disposition. Um, 
Okay, that's my first set of points. The second is, and because I'm a discussant, I take no responsibility, my points do not have to be coherent. I can just pick <laughs> things that I want to say. Um, the, the second is with regard to the, Pat's points about deterrence failure and, and North Korea. Um, and here, you know, I don't, I don't disagree with them. I think um, there are, you know, I think that there are things that the United States has proven to be pretty good at when it comes to uh, um, uh, uses of force uh, with regard to North Korea. I mean, we've been pretty good at deterring a second Korean War, right? Um, uh, we've been pretty good at deterring an attack on Japan by the North, which some of you may not think is plausible, but if you just listen to North Korean rhetoric, um, it's not something that you can, if I was a Japanese security planner, I would not take those statements lightly. And we're also good at non-deterrence things. I think we're Pat may disagree, many in this room may disagree. I think we're pretty good at negotiating with North Korea. Um, I think we're pretty good at rewarding mm -hmm. North Korea. Um, and I think we're pretty good at sanctioning North Korea, uh, whether it's financial sanctions or the sanctions that have been on since the end of the Korean War. I agree entirely, with Pat, we're not good at two things, unfortunately. Um, we are not good at deterring missile or nuclear tests. Right? We are unable to deter their missile or nuclear tests. I guess we could deter, deter their missile tests if we started talking more about um, declaratory statements with regard to missile defense. But whenever I talk to anybody from who does missile defense, they don't want to go there, right? A declaratory statement on missile tests and how you would defend against them. Um, and the second thing that we're not, we have not been good at deterring is uh, the thing that we just saw a few months ago, which is limited conventional acts of aggression uh, that don't lead to all-out war. Right? Uh, I think everything that the United States and allies have been doing since the sinking of the Chan'an has been aimed at trying to deter further limited conventional provocations short of war. Uh, but I don't think anybody sitting here can say they're fully confident uh, that the combination of military exercising and financial sanctions will be enough to deter North Korea from another limited conventional provocation. These are just two things that we haven't, that we haven't been good at when it comes to um, deterring North Korea. And then finally, on the, on the last set of points on the utility of um, uh, nuclear deterrence on the peninsula, um, I don't know the answer. I mean, I don't know how to respond to Patrick's last point. I don't know whether I agree or disagree with it. Uh, what I will say is that um, um, a couple of things. The first is putting aside the question of whether extended nuclear deterrence is still militarily necessary on the peninsula. Just putting aside that question. Um, I think as he alluded to, there are very important symbolic ramifications of either maintaining nuclear deterrence on the peninsula or not, or not extending um, uh, the nuclear umbrella. Um, the first is that with regard to North Korea, and Bob can speak to this as well, um, if there were ever a point at which the United States would no longer uh, maintain uh, nuclear deterrence or an extended nuclear umbrella over its allies, um, we have no understanding of how the North Koreans would perceive this. Um, they could, on the one hand, perceive it as being a major act of conciliation on the part of the United States, aimed at finally ending the Korean War uh, and moving to something more along the lines of mutual security rather than competitive security. On the other hand, they could view it as an admission of defeat by the United States and its allies, uh, and therefore give the North Koreans the false or misperceived confidence that they now exercise um, nuclear superiority on the peninsula, uh, which could lead to all sorts of misguided and misintended coercive bargaining on the part of the North. The second is the effect on allies. If we don't have a nuclear umbrella over Japan or Korea, even if they feel that in terms of a military conflict they could win, Right, even if they still feel that they could win with conventional weapons, um, 
it's difficult to imagine that this would not have a major impact on perceptions. Um, and I'm not just talking here about the military perceptions, but uh, the perceptions with regard to markets, right? Uh, we've all seen that whenever the North does something, uh, nuclear test, Chonan incident, the markets in Asia basically don't move, right? Because as long, the, the primary variable for markets is the American security commitment. If you substantially change that security commitment by saying that we don't have continued nuclear, uh, to hold a nuclear umbrella over our allies, that would have, I think, more of an impact on markets in Asia than any uh, new North Korean provocation. Um, and then the third point is, I, I agree with Pat, we have to figure out a way, but the, the, I think the thing that concerns me most about North Korea and the percep they, perception they have of their nuclear capabilities is that whatever we do, we want to ensure that they do not feel more confident in their nuclear capabilities. Because the more confident the North feels, even if they're wrong, the more confident they feel in their nuclear capabilities, the less they will rely on their conventional deterrent. And the less they rely on their conventional deterrent, anytime you have a potential escalation situation, right? anytime you have a spark or a potential escalation situation, what it creates for the North, you know, in the deterrence literature, it creates use or lose incentives, right? Immediate use or lose incentives. If they don't feel, if they become increasingly reliant on their nuclear capabilities, regardless of how imperfect they may be, uh, and less reliant, or, or they put less resources into their conventional deterrent, then you have a recipe for extreme destabilization and rapid escalation, which I think all of us want to avoid on the peninsula. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Victor. And now the view from North Korea, <laughs> from Bob. Not really. <laughs> thank you. I am, I'm happy to be here, and that's all I'm going to say because I only have 10 minutes, so. <laughs> Normally I start with a, it's always good to start with a joke, but jokes take a long time. So I'll just start with the opening line of one. A priest, a rabbi, and the head of Office 39 of the Central Committee walk into a bar. Those of you who have read the uh, sanctions know what that's about. Uh, this, uh, this summer I have to admit that I have been very dyspeptic, and it might be the heat, but it might also be a lot of the silliness that I've seen in the newspapers about North Korea, some of it emanating from this city, some of it in other places. And in fact, none of it is useful as this discussion has been thus far today. So I, I admit to you, I was really prepared um, not to like what Dr. Morgan had to say. I was convinced that it was going to be wrong. And I'm delighted to say that I was wrong. That um, imagine my surprise when something um, laying out the situation that exists today with a nuclear North Korea actually starts in the right place. And what is the right place? The right place is the admission, the acknowledgement that yes, they are nuclear capable. Uh, yes, this has altered the landscape in Northeast Asia in ways we don't yet fully understand. As Victor said, there are a lot of questions out there. And maybe, and this is where Dr. Morgan made, a, I think, an important contribution, maybe there's something in this new situation which given the fact that we're stuck with it, isn't all bad, and we might actually be able to turn it to our advantage. Now, what does that mean? Well, you start with the notion that, at least today, extended deterrence is probably 
much less relevant than it has ever been vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea. In fact, we don't really know if it was ever effective against the North Koreans. We assume that since there hasn't been a North Korean attack since June 1950, that that's due to extended deterrence. We won't know until we see the North Korean archives. But I'm willing to take, you know, I'll take the point. Question is now, what is the situation? Now that the North Koreans are nuclear capable and, and um, may even have reached the point where they have some deliverable weapons, how does that affect our use of uh, deterrence vis-a-vis -vis the North? There might be two questions that we can ask ourselves. To what extent and how has the North Korean possession of nuclear weapons altered the, sim the symbolism as well as the application of deterrence in Northeast Asia? And I point out both uh, Dr. Morgan and Victor both emphasized, and I think they're right, that deterrence has at least as much symbolic importance, psychological importance, as it does real military application. In fact, maybe more of that than the other, which doesn't mean it's not important. It just means um, the, the content is different than what we might imagine. Second question. To what extent and in what ways has North Korean acquisition of nuclear weapons made our nuclear deterrence actually more useful when it comes to negotiations? Have we actually stepped, quite by accident, but actually stepped into a room which is a little bit more hospitable in the long run to negotiations on this issue than we might imagine. Why is that? Again, we go back to the psychology and the symbolism of the nuclear deterrence and the fact that, as Victor pointed out, there have been several times in the past when this very issue has entered into USDPRK talks. The North Koreans have said they wanted to see some change in uh, the U.S. The rhetorical U.S. nuclear posture. And so what did they get? They got, um, uh, in the agreed framework, actually are the first negative security assurance. Now, the North Koreans knew that that wasn't worth anything, really, in terms of the nuclear threat. But it symbolized a new U.S. approach larger diplomatic approach to North Korea. And that was important to them. So in a, a modification of the rhetorical position, and an, a negative security assurance was a big deal, as Victor said. I mean, and in fact, we never really got it out of the Pentagon. There was a lot of smoke and mirrors attached to that. Such that when it came out in, in 2005, a lot of jaws dropped open, like the Russians did. How come it got so easy to do all of a sudden? Again, the North Koreans didn't believe the paper. That wasn't the issue. The issue is how does that, how is that useful? Because it's part of the terms of trade between the U.S. and North Korea when it comes to establishing a new political relationship. In 1994, uh, during the agreed framework talks, um, there was a, a very rough, a week or so when, uh, I can't remember why it was as a matter of fact, but anyway, we started a fairly obvious and highly publicized exercise off the coast of Korea, and I think it involved a, I think it involved a carrier, I'm not positive now, I forget. But anyway, the North Koreans were very exercised about it. And we were in Geneva talking to them, and so we took some of them aside and said to them, what's the problem we exercise all the time? 
And the answer was, we know you exercise all the time. Why do you have to rub our noses in it? Why does it have to be so public? I think the same thing applies to deterrence and extended deterrence. I think the North Koreans are much more capable of living with it as long as we don't rub their noses in it, as long as it doesn't show up in a communique we sign with the South Koreans. That's what they object to because they know perfectly well that there's no way they can get us to furl the nuclear umbrella completely. There's always going to be a missile in North Dakota or South Dakota, whoever it is, which can hit Pyongyang. That's reality, and they're used to living with that. As a matter of fact, as, as Dr. Morgan said, our conventional capability is so crushing to the North Koreans that, that, you know, that the nuclear threat is just sort of one existential step above that. It really, it really isn't um, by itself, I don't think, so effective. I don't think the North Koreans, as I said, I don't think they care about our actually removing the umbrella in fact, and they might find it useful. How can that be? Believe it or not, the North Koreans do think strategically about their position in Northeast Asia. Sometimes they think more strategically than we do. And they like to look at the larger picture and where they fit. And where they fit is not in the Chinese pocket, they hope. They hope. And, and a U.S. presence uh, in that regard is a useful thing. And the extended deterrence is a sign in one sense of the commitment of the United States. It's extended commitment to Northeast Asia. So they may sometimes complain and fuss about uh, extended deterrence, but balanced against that is their sense that they need some form, important form of lasting American commitment in the region. What can we therefore accomplish uh, in utilizing this extended de deterrence directly with the North Koreans? Well, we can't accomplish anything with it, I don't think, if we don't eventually engage in some sort of conversation with them. Because there are a lot of things we have to know about their concept of the utility of their nuclear weapons apart from their public statements. Those are a good starting point, but it's not the entirety of the North Korean thinking on this issue. And unless we sit down and talk to them about it at length, uh, in depth, uh, we're not going to be able to figure out the danger points that Victor very rightly pointed out, the points at which they may have misconceptions, and the points at which they're willing to, to um, not to press on the nuclear issue, not to use it for uh, compellence, and in fact, not to misuse the deterrence. So I think, A, what we have here in beginning to discuss deterrence uh, and the continued effectiveness of U.S. deterrence in East Asia, it begins with a recognition of the fact that North Korea is a nuclear weapons state. A lot of people shudder at that use of the term, but if we, if we manage to accept it, I use the word accept advisedly, I know that it raises hackles, so I use another term. But if we manage to recognize that we're going to have to live with it for a while and deal with the North Koreans on that basis, I think that there's more room um, for the two sides to make a few steps, important steps forward than might seem to be the case uh, at, first, at first blush. Thanks, Bob. Jofi, how does all this look through a, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> how does all this look through a, an arms control and nonproliferation lens? Sure. Thanks for that, Sharon. 
You had asked me um, in preparing for this presentation to focus on how the Obama administration can square a seeming contradiction, which is uh, remaining committed to the president's speech in Prague over a year ago where he laid out the peace and security of a world free of nuclear weapons and at the same time remain committed to extended regional deterrence, not just in Northeast Asia, but in Europe and other regions where U.S. vital interests are at play. And I'm going to try to see how we can square that seeming contradiction in my brief remarks. Uh, just to, to remind everyone, in April of 2009, the President laid out his nuclear weapons, nonproliferation, arms control agenda, and he called for a world without nuclear weapons, reminding everyone that this vision would take patience and persistence and that no one in his administration is under the illusion that such a world will come into reality anytime soon in the near future. <clears throat> Indeed, the President said that it may not occur in his own lifetime. What I think sometimes critics of the so-called Prague vision miss is that the process of getting to a world of zero is as important, if not more important, than the ultimate end state of a world without nuclear weapons. Reducing the role and salience of nuclear arms is an essential step in the path to zero, and it can bring immediate security benefits to the United States and our friends and allies, even as nuclear weapons continue to exist. The Nuclear Posture Review, which was concluded earlier this year, reinforced this perspective through a number of steps aimed at reducing the role of nuclear weapons. First, it announced an important shift in our declaratory policy to emphasize that the United States will not use or threaten the use of nuclear weapons against non-nuclear weapon states that are state parties to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and that are in compliance with their nuclear non-proliferation obligations. The NPR also established a recognition that the United States will only consider the use of nuclear weapons in extreme circumstances where it is necessary to defend our vital national interests. Third and finally, the NPR established a decision to strengthen our conventional capabilities such that the United States can reduce the role of nuclear weapons in deterring non-nuclear attacks and establish the objective of eventually eventually making the deterrence of nuclear attack on the United States and our friends and allies the sole purpose of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. This commitment to reducing the saliency of nuclear weapons as we seek the eventual peace and security of a world free of nuclear weapons does not conflict with our present day commitment to maintain regional deterrence and enhance reassurance for our friends and allies, including those in Northeast Asia. This administration has put forth a very pragmatic view that so long as nuclear weapons exist, the United States will undertake every effort to ensure our nuclear arsenal remains safe, secure, and effective. At the same time, as was promulgated in the Nuclear Posture Review, so long as regional nuclear threats remain to our forces, allies, and partners, U.S. Mm -hmm. deterrence will continue to require a nuclear component. This approach applies equally to Northeast Asia as it does to other regions where U.S. vital interests are at play. I, I think a similar analogy is the debate that's happening right now in the Senate over ratification of the New START <laughs> Treaty. Uh, the administration has been getting some flack from our friends in the progressive community because at the same time as we're moving forward in what we hope will be mutual strategic nuclear reductions with the Russian Federation, we're also taking steps to reinvigorate our commitment to the U.S. nuclear weapons complex through a 10-year spending plan that significantly increases the resources necessary to maintain our nuclear arsenal. And we square that contradiction again with the recognition that even though we're committed to eliminating nuclear weapons, this process is going to take a long time. And so long as nuclear weapons exist, this president and this administration has a responsibility to ensure those weapons will work if we ever, God forbid, have to use them. And I think the same issue is at play here in terms of a world without nuclear weapons and the concept of extended regional deterrence. There is no contradiction there. The process of step-by-step -step reductions in the numbers and roles of nuclear weapons 
which will be a challenging, time-consuming process, can only move forward so long as the United States and our allies retain confidence in our existing security and deterrence arrangements. So I'm not sure if I quite square the contradiction there, but I think we in the administration feel that we're intellectually consistent and that the Prague vision is consistent with continuing commitments to our allies and friends in Northeast Asia. And I know everyone is anxious to get to questions, so I'm going to stop my remarks there. Thanks, Jofi. Um, while you are all gathering your thoughts, I might take the prerogative of the chair and ask a question or two. Let me just remind you um, that we have some microphones that will circulate around the room. And uh, please state your name and your affiliation. And out of respect for your colleagues, make this a question <laughs> rather than a comment. Um, I'm going to dive in and query Bob. You said, um, and it's this term about accepting North Korea's nuclear weapons. I'm not a regional specialist. I deal more with arms control and nonproliferation. And in nonproliferation, we're constantly um, uh, beleaguered by <laughs> this problem of discrimination in the field, right? So you know, you accept India's nuclear weapons, and you 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 uh, get a lot of flack. What what would I'm assuming it's not tacit recognition, uh, uh, not, not explicit recognition. What, what would, for you, accepting North Korea's nuclear weapons be? I think the first step would simply be to agree to um, talk to them about something other than nuclear weapons. In other words, don't make it f first foremost and only uh, item on the agenda. It can be on the agenda. Um, they'll, they'll make their statement, we'll make their statement, and then we'll see if there are other things to discuss. But right now it seems to me that it's the sole focus, and that's the problem. Um, <clears throat> um, I would, you know, the... Um, I mean, to me, a very useful thing would be if um, we either at the track one or track two level could engage with uh, a dialogue with North Korea on the whole logic of nuclear deterrence to see whether they understand. I mean, this was done with the Soviets early on in the Cold War, and that would be a useful thing because one of the things, again, that concerns me is that they may have very wrong conceptions of what is <coughs> their nuclear deterrent, what constitutes their nuclear deterrent. And that can create all sorts of problems in an escalation ladder. The, the obvious political obstacle to that, and I think, it's a, I think it's a very big one, is that the minute you start to do that, even if you don't explicitly or tacitly accept North Korea as a nuclear weapon state, the minute you engage in that dialogue, everybody's going to say you've accepted North Korea as a nuclear weapon state. And that will have all sorts of ripple effects throughout the region, particularly among allies, who will, you know, who will then draw a link between that and questions about um, the credibility of um, U.S. extended nuclear deterrence. So, I mean, that's a policy box that I think it's, it's, that's difficult to get out of. Um, but from, from an academic perspective, you would want to have that conversation. I would only quickly note that the challenge of talking to North Korea without having denuclearization front and center on the agenda is that it's very, very difficult for any U.S. administration to engage in such talks unless that issue is front and center. Uh, the reason why, frankly, we care about North Korea is because of what they've done in the nuclear field. And without that, this wouldn't be high on the agenda for any administration. Say very quickly, repeat again. You have to always think in terms of the context within which the United States puts this. That is, you don't, you care about North Korea because of the proliferation, because the proliferation is damaging to the regional security 
management that the United States tries to provide, and also to security management in other places. That's the real problem, see? And um, so I'm not sure. I know I understand what Victor's saying, because it's, it really would be very important to have a conversation with him. And maybe you have to do it at track two if it's possible, but that, that hasn't worked very well with them compared to other people. So, um, because extended nuclear deterrence is very symbolic, and you do have the kind of effect you mentioned. So, I, and I think you're right then, Jeffrey. You can't really just talk with them about something else. We really care about this. So we can talk about other things, but this is the single most important thing because it isn't just U.S.-North Korean relations. It's because the United States has a larger set of fish it's frying that it's got to attend to, and this is relevant to that. So that's the problem I see. See, I don't see an easy way around that uh, unless you get the North Koreans, the Chinese tell them, you got to talk with the United States about nuclear weapons. We can't, you know, it's not going to work otherwise. This is... To me, this is the same problem we had uh, during the agreed framework talks. We focused at the beginning like a laser on the nuclear issue. And we were sputtering and slipping and sliding and not making a lot of progress. And the reason was the nuclear issue is not a big problem for the North Koreans. It's a big problem for us. They have other things they want to discuss. So how do you weave together our concerns and have them discuss, absolutely, they need to be addressed, but the North Koreans have also a list of things and we need to be able to talk about those at the same time. When you can get that balance, it seems to me, you, you're more liable to get satisfaction on our end rather than just telling them this is all we're gonna talk about. I have an idea, maybe we can just call it nuclear security. <laughs> Do I see questions from the floor? Yes, please. Hi, I, hello. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm Jing Yi Zhang with Phoenix TV. Uh, I have a question to uh, Dr. Chai and uh, Mr. Joseph. It's about after visit in uh, China, uh, Kim Jong-il say, said he wants to resume the uh, <coughs> six-party talk, and how you see that? and. Uh, what the U.S. should uh, want and need to achieve if there's any six-party talk uh, to it. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, I'll just say that, uh, you know, a senior Chinese official is in Washington this week. He's going to be meeting with a series of State Department officials tomorrow, including Deputy Secretary Steinberg. We're looking forward to learning what transpired in this visit of Kim Jong-il to China, and we're just as eager as everyone else to find out what happened. So. Um, the, um, um, the fact that um, it was reported that Kim Jong-il said he was ready to come back to six-party talks, I mean, would I take that as an encouraging sign? No. <laughs> Um, I think we've been down this road too many times, too many times. Um, and, uh, you know, I think for any who've been involved in this, you know, you'll, you'll I mean, the, basically the, the standard line is you'll, you'll, I'll believe it when I see it. You know, when I see the delegation arrive in Beijing and show up at the Daiyutai on time, then I'll believe it. Uh, until then, I won't believe it. Um, and then, um, 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 with regard to what the U.S. agenda would be, I mean, in spite of this, this debate the, or the discussion that we've just had, I think, as um, Jovi said, I mean, you know, it's pretty clear what the priority of the um, administration is and has been. Um, uh, right now there is, you know, a still once there is a standing agreement negotiated in 2005 and 2007 uh, that the North Koreans have not fully implemented. I don't see any negotiations of a new agreement yet, so until that happens, this is the agreement that they uh, must come back to. Um, at least I, uh, that would be my reading of the U.S. perspective. Okay. Two, 
Thanks. Um, Chad O'Carroll from the Centre for Arms Control. Uh, this is a question for you, Pat. Um, just from a deterrence point of view, how do North Korea's nuclear weapons change things from the American and South Korean perspective? Because remember, for a long time, they've obviously had a lot of artillery that could do some very serious damage. So I'd just like to see what you think the nuclear weapons, how, how they make a difference. Thanks. I don't think they make much of a difference in terms of, of I think more, they make a difference more in terms of what Victor's been talking about. That is, do the North Koreans understand what it means to have something like that kind of capability and uh, be opposing people who are trying to figure out, A, what that capability actually is, and B, whether you really know what you're doing, um, and who uh, don't like you and don't trust you. <laughs> and it's that kind of thing. And, and the threat to Seoul is much more central, I think. And also, in general, the threat of having a war at all. I know public opinion polls on the peninsula show, even after Jen up, you know, if you don't have an overwhelming sense that North Korea is awful and we, you know, there's this terrific concern about not going back through another serious war, even if you win, kind of, of thing. And the prior administration, in fact, reflected a lot of that. And, and, and so put, made the priority one of interacting with the North. Uh, it was because you didn't get, seem to get anywhere that, that you get the current administration saying not that they are quite ready to, if necessary, uh, have some kind of military confrontation. So that I don't think the North has gained anything by getting the nuclear weapons. Uh, and it has certainly made it harder, as was explained, to get the other side not to want to insist certain things have to come first or else because uh, they have the suspicion that the North is going to continue to try to extract. And that's too bad. I would like to see honest conversations with the North and more serious effort at, um, I wouldn't call it reconciliation, but at least a substantial effort to once again go back toward uh, providing North Korea with a lot of reassurance plus a lot of um, positive incentives. Most of the studies of deterrence suggest that deterrence works best when you couple it with some kinds of incentives. If you can find a way to do that that doesn't somehow weaken the impact of the threats themselves, then there are ways in which reassurances and so on can make a big difference. And this, the North Koreans are very hard to reassure. I mean, given their attitudes, given their, their position. So and I don't want to make that easy, but it suggests it's easy at all. But I don't see the nuclear weapons as themselves substantially altering their negotiating position, their leverage, their ability to blackmail and so on. Thanks. Okay, I think Victor wants to respond and then, okay. Um, um, well, you know, I think, um, I think it potentially, North Korea, I mean, their nuclear weapons could potentially change the equation um, um, and there'll probably be people who disagree. I know there will be people who disagree with this, but suppose this ship, you know, they took down this ship uh, last March, right? Uh, people wondered why did they do it. They killed, what, 40-something sailors, but they were trying to, 48, but they're trying to kill everybody, right? Over 100, trying to take down the whole boat. Um, you know, why would they do this? Were they worried about retaliation? Did they not think that the United States and ROK would retaliate, you know, with, with, with something that was basically an act of war, right? It was an act of war. Um, you know, a one interpretation, and if you're a national security planner, you have to take the worst case situation. You're not going to assume the best case, is that they may have some sort of, sort of false sense that they are now a nuclear weapon state, and therefore it, invulnerable, invulnerable, invulnerable to any sort of retaliation, right? That dramatically changes the strategic equation in the region. Um, and that, that would be very concerning. Now, we don't know if that was one of the things that motivated them to prosecute an act of war, um, but you cannot rule it out as a possibility. And that would directly derive from their, possess or their perceived possession of nuclear weapons where they see themselves now as a nuclear weapon state. Okay, right here. 
Hi, I'm Kaho from NHK Japan. Um, my question is something about yesterday's declaration um, by the United States of the new set of sanctions. Uh, I immediately uh, remember what happened after uh, BDA um, 2005 uh, of like uh, North Koreans just setting off um, their nuclear tests um, after, I remember after US declaring uh, sanctions against them. Uh, do you see any bright outcome of this new set of sanctions um, for the new North Koreans to finally sit around the table for <coughs> really discussing um, denuclearization? I, I fear that it's going to be a sign of new, for them, um, they, they have to act for another set of uh, provocations. What is your thought on that? Well, let me just respond. Um, you know, we see the sanctions announcement issued yesterday as a continuation of the two-track strategy this, this administration has pursued since the spring of 2009, uh, essentially tightening the pressure on North Korea. What the sanctions yesterday announced did was uh, our, the previous executive order that was in existence focused on North Korea's WMD and missile programs. And the executive order announced yesterday, as laid out by Bob Einhorn and Stuart Levy, is that it expanded the focus to include uh, the various illicit activities conducted by North Korean entities, whether it be cigarette smuggling, money laundering, other activities that are designed to funnel revenue into North Korea's WMD programs to take into account those programs and try to tighten the squeeze to ensure that the North Korean regime is not able to continue using funds to further these WMD capabilities. Um, it, um, it, it does not represent any fundamental shift in the approach of the administration. Rather, we see it more as a continuation. Thank you. I'm John Caves, National Defense University. Uh, if I may, uh, two, because one is a quick follow-up to something that Dr. Chara said. And that would be, Dr. Chara, whether you think that the Chonin sinking is something fundamentally new type of provocation, or, or does it just fit into the pattern of some very aggressive, limited aggressive acts that North Korea has taken periodically since the uh, end of the Korean War? The original question was uh, thoughts from the panel as to whether South Korea's continuing interest in investment in long-range strike weapons, most recently a 1,500-kilometer cruise missile, says anything about the state of extended deterrence there and what contributions uh, it might make to deterrence on the peninsula in general. On the first question, I, you know, whether the China represents a new type of provocation by the North, I mean, we have seen um, provocations by the North in the past, as you know, uh, EC-121, Blue House Raid, Pueblo, um, um, 858, KL-858. Um, but I think what was, to me at least, most disturbing about this one was that um, we haven't had one of those in a while. We haven't had one of the, you know a, a serious um, serious conventional provocation of this nature in in quite some time. I mean we've had skirmishes in the West Sea, uh, but we haven't had an attack on a on a uh, on a ship. Um, and uh, you know it does concern me that there this may be a new level of provocation, and we can debate about what it's designed to do. Right? Some may say it's designed to rattle everyone's cage and get everybody to talk to the North, blackmail in other words. Others may see it as a demonstration of basically new coercive bargaining leverage that the North feels it has because it has capabilities now, um, that particularly nuclear capabilities that it may not have had when it raided the Blue House or took out uh, or took down the U.S. Um, spy plane in in the 19, late 1960s. So um, it, it does concern me that it is a new type of provocation. And um, you know, the, I think the answer is something that the administration has tried to wrestle with, which is you know, how do you come up with a response that satisfies allies' concerns but also 
is strong enough to deter another sort of provocation, but not too strong that you start a war. And that's, you know, that's a very difficult hold to try to get the needle through. And, um, you know, so, you know, following on Jofi's comments, I, I mean, I can't, um, as implied in the earlier question, I can't really fault the administration for pursuing the sanctions and the exercising that it's now, the military exercising that it's now pursuing because I really don't think they have a choice um, and that they need to do it. And on the second question, um, I think I'd say, remember the um, American effort to uh, reach an agreement, uh, and an agreement was reached with the prior administration, no administration, on uh, shifting the Combined Forces Command, wartime Combined Forces Command, into South Korean hands, accompanied by South Korean plans to sharply escalate their uh, military capabilities, so that South Korea would be more in charge of its defenses. And in that connection, it makes a lot of sense for, North Korea, for South Korea then to have relief from the missile controls that have existed, uh, limiting the range of the missiles that they could develop. Uh, and I just assumed that, you know, that that would go along with it in the end. Uh, if they're really going to be much more centrally in charge of their national defense, and they're living across the way from a serious set of uh, artillery capabilities that could damage the national capital uh, and facing other kinds of North Korean missiles, it's obvious that they would want to have this kind of additional capability and for precisely for deterrence purposes. And so I've just assumed that th that would go along with this. Now, it's been delayed, of course, uh, partly because of the Jong un incident, incident and also because of a lot of pressure inside South Korea on this. So uh, nervousness about uh, the current deterrent situation, um, plus evidence, you know, they haven't been able to spend the money. Uh, on, so they're not meeting the budget targets just for the improvements. So um, they're not fully comfortable with making the shift yet. It's now delayed several years. And, um, but I think the logic of it is that if you go down this road, then that missile constraint has to go away in the north uh, and the south has to be developing missiles that give it more range. Thanks, Sharon. Chris Nelson, Nelson Report. Nice to see you over there. Right, so taller. <laughs> yeah. I wish I was taller and thinner, but anyway. Um, <laughs> a fascinating discussion because uh, I, and please correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm hearing is that we all agree there's a ton of stuff we got to talk to the Norks about, you know, that's really important and it's strategic and it's perceptual and it's about nukes and it's about their sense of security and, you know, what do they think of the latest inspector? Oh, novel, you know, a lot of stuff that's very important. Uh, we got to get on it. But I'm also hearing from, you know, Brother Bader, uh, courtesy of, uh, of uh, the New York Times on Saturday or from Jofi today, that, yeah, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. We're not going to talk to them about anything until they get back and start performing on the agreements they made in 05 and 07, period, end of conversation. So, you know, we've got a hell of a problem here because we all agree we've, we need to talk, and yet there seems to be a very firm policy that we're simply not gonna do it until they go back and start doing stuff. So my question to you is, is this a bridgeable gap? Uh, or are we stuck with this until or unless your leader has gone to his reward, we find out if the brother-in-law is really the chief, you know, is Les son really going to be the leader? You know, are, are we in for two, three, four, five more years of, yeah, we need to talk, but we're not going to do it? Uh, uh, and if not, uh, uh, what can we do about it? Thanks. If I could just add to that, we get somebody to say, comment on the fact that, that there was the story in the paper that the administration is beginning to think about some ways of talking with the North again. And I wondered if that was, in fact, a partial... Uh, Oh, what do I want to say, a straw sent out there, so some kind of trial balloon or something, just to see what the reactions would be around town, around among friends and allies out in Japan, et cetera. Um, and I don't know anything about that, but I thought maybe somebody here who lives in this town would be able to suggest. Trophy is going to tell us. I, I, I'm not oh, going to get that's I, right. He's going to tell us. I, I'm not going to get into that second question. But, um, <laughs> you know, in response to Chris's question about whether there's 
there's some way to bridge that gap? I think there is. I mean, it's important to keep in mind that the administration is not calling on the North Koreans to fully implement anything and everything in the 2005 and 2007 joint statements before we sit down and talk to them. Of course not. What we are saying, though, is that we don't find it sufficient simply for the North Koreans to say, we would like to restart the six-party talks process. Will you come back to the table? We would like to see some evidence that the North Koreans are actually sincere about carrying out their denuclearization commitments, some sign that they're willing to go beyond just mere words before we're ready to once again pursue this path of, of talks with the North Koreans. Um, the, the only thing I would add is um, we've seen this gap before. <laughs> yep. We're all familiar with it. We've seen it um, in years past. And um, sooner or later, it always manages to be bridged one way or the other. And I would imagine in this case as well, I don't know when. Uh, I don't know if it's two or five years or when. Um, but, um, you know, right now we have um, – two tracks, which has been the military exercising and the sanctions. Um, and sooner or later, you, you're going to have to have the third track, which is some form of um, uh, dialogue or negotiation. Um, and, you know, the big, you know, the, the, the big question in terms of closing that gap is always that do you have to give up any of the first two in order to get the third, right? And that has always been one of the problems or the challenges for U.S. policy whenever we've gotten into one, well, not when we, when the North Koreans have put us in one of these situations. I wouldn't think that bad policy would be sustainable for a long time, except that it has been since 2002. It's lasted a long time, and I'm afraid it can last longer not because there aren't smart people in the right places, but because the politics uh, of the situation, not just in this country, but in you know countries of our allies, just don't favor um, the right the right decisions and a sense of leadership coming to the fore. It's not hopeless, but um, it's <laughs> it's a good time. Uh, to go fishing, I think. <laughs> We're going to take, oh, two more questions. Let's take them together, and then I think our time will be up. So right in all the way in the back, we'll take both questions, okay, one after another. Sure. Timothy Walton with Delix Consulting Studies and Analysis. Um, my question is more oriented to you, Dr. Morgan. Um, to clarify, are you advocating that the U.S. increase pressure and costs on China to facilitate negotiations in North Korea? If so, what mechanisms would you espouse, and what effects do you think the what effects do you think these could have on broader U.S. security interests and concerns in Asia, such as in the South China Sea? Okay. From, from Voice of America, I have a follow-up question on U.S. government's position on the resumption of this disparate talk to Mr. Joffrey Joseph. Uh, you just mentioned that the uh, U.S. government doesn't want the full implementation of all this agreement in 2005-2007 from North Korea. Uh, then can you specify or elaborate what specific condition or what specific step or what specific sign do you want from North Korea to actually uh, resume this uh, negotiation or talk? Thank you. I wouldn't... I wouldn't say that I want to advocate it. I would just simply say it's very difficult to pursue a policy of using pressure, sanctions, threats, and the like uh, if the other side has resources that enable it to minimize the harm that those either are inflicting or could inflict. And that means you have to look again at your situation with that in mind. And I worry about the Chinese attitude with regard to North Korea. I understood in the past the Chinese view, which was, at least in part, that the kind of 
attitude the United States was taking was fundamentally an infringement on national sovereignty, uh, and that's a very dangerous thing. And I understand the Chinese view on that. I used to teach in China, and I, you know, I heard the Chinese talk a lot. More recently, I've begun to worry that it is an extension of a general Chinese view that the American security arrangements in East Asia need to be sharply altered. That's a much, much more complicated thing. That that is more important than whether or not the North Korean problem is solved. That solving it in some way that's compatible with American objectives is unacceptable to China. That's a very different kind of thing. And, and I would very much want to know much more about Chinese views before you would talk about whether you would resort to some kind of pressure. It, given the way the U.S. has tried to manage East Asian security, directly confronting and pressuring China would be unwise. But if the Chinese themselves find uh, this American com management it unacceptable, well, that opens up a whole different case. Thanks, Pat. Uh, just in response to the second question, I want to make sure that we're very clear. Uh, the administration remains strongly committed to ensuring that the North Koreans live up to the commitments of both the 2005 and 2007 joint statements, and there's absolutely no hedge there. Um, look, the North Koreans know what's expected of them. We have had talks going back to the last administration on uh, what the steps they need in order to carry out the commitments in those statements. Uh, it's been repeated time and time again. Secretary Clinton has spoken about this. There should be no confusion about that. And what we want to see from the North Koreans is, you know, not just simply an expression of wanting to return to talks, but some signal that they are prepared, in fact, to carry out the commitments that they have made previously. Do you have any last words from our panels? So let me thank you for a terrific session. It was really very interesting. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>